the last six lecture. <laughs> ah, sorry. <laughs> okay. Ah, uh, there are many methods for doing blind source separation. Uh, blind so se source separation means uh, separate mixed signals from observed signals without prior knowledge. So, as explained in the last lecture, there are several types of methods. Uh, separation of filtering, uh, time frequency masking, and uh, model based separation. Uh, the independent component analysis uh, is belongs, uh, belongs to the uh, spatial filtering. So I'd like to talk about this today. Uh, at first, I'd like to explain time domain ICA. Uh, the mixture model is y equals double dot x. Y, y is a separated signal and <coughs> x is an observed signal by using the microphones. And w is a separated matrix. Uh, we calculate the w by uh, until the PDF of separated signal is uh, literally independent. Uh, each y line is uh, each half. There is one more way to uh, doing ICA. Uh, there is a subband frequency domain ICA. In this case, it, it takes cube ICA in each FFTP. So this is a two, two input signals and two microphones. And we do FFT for each micro uh, input signals. And uh, there are many, you know, uh, 're doing uh, sub subband ICA uh, to, uh, to callback library divergence is often used to evaluate the independence. Thank you. 
real answer. Uh, the features of the years I love it. There is a drawback for subband ICA. So By doing permit, uh, uh, as a permutation solver, there are two main uh, methods. There are two main methods. Uh, one is correlated correlation based, and second one is directivity based. Ah, sorry about no figures. <laughs> this one is a cluster by uh, using correlation based approach. Uh, this one is Here is a variation. Uh, I have a, a separated some signals. So the original one is uh, three three sounds mixture of English speech and Japanese speech. In the course of a December tour in Yorkshire, I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding Christmas. The coach was crowded. Okay. Second one is. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet. Sorry. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary to do so. The third one is. The mixed one is. Ah, this is a mixed signal of microphone one. So there is uh, two, two more signals: microphone two and microphone three. And the separated signal is. In the course of the December tour in Yorkshire. I rode for a long distance in one of the public coaches on the day preceding. And second ways. To administer medicine to animals is frequently a very difficult matter, and yet sometimes it's necessary. Today I don't have any uh, figures of evaluation, but uh, uh, evaluation can be done by using uh, NR noise reduction rate. Uh, 
、noise, noise reduction rate is、uh, input SNR <coughs> divided by output SNR. Input SNR is XT is observed signal and NT is、uh, inferring, inferring signals of input sound. That output SNR can be defined as follows YT is a separate sound and NT is a, a inferring element of in, included in output signal. Yeah. Yes. As future work, there are、uh, two types of future work. By using prior knowledge,、uh, the, we can separate signals more efficiently. Like independent vector analysis, or by using kernel trick, we can also separate it more efficiently.、Uh, this is kernel ICA.、Uh, okay. That's all for my presentation. Thank you. Yeah. The question the examples that you showed us, did you do the separation yourself with some code or did you find them related? I don't know. How about you show us the code of it? How about you show us a bit of the code that you wrote? Oh, code. Were they instantaneous messages? Or、uh, no, no, uh, not instantaneous,、uh, convolved mixtures.、Uh. So, what were the f i l t e r s like? Yeah. Code,、uh, yeah. Like this. <laughs> <laughs> Is that enough? Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, what kind of,、uh, what kind of mixing filters and what kind of filters do you want? Well, you say it's, com- it's convoluted, so they're being mixed with some spreading. So, what kind of、uh, filter is being used to mix them? Ah, mixing filters? Yeah.、Uh, I've, uh, how should I say? <laughs> I, I recorded the impulse response and converted the impulse response to the original signal and gener- generated the inputs. Mix sound. Are、uh, the limits to how to the kinds of、uh, impulse response that these systems can handle? Ah, what, are the, what are the limits on the kinds of filter that can be, that, that, that can work?、Uh, I, you mean, uh, if any,、uh, we will、uh, record the signal in a c h o i c environment,、yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, we cannot、uh, separate, we can separate the signal over the length of uh, uh, the impulse response. Of Over the length of、uh, reverb, r e l e n g t h of reverb, reverb l a n d s How should I say? So, is this stuff、uh, useful? Is it practical? Is it, it seems like, that, has this stuff actually been used in real, real devices? Real devices? Ah,、uh, yeah, uh, for, uh, for, you,、uh, for um, to use in real devices.、Well. Uh, we, we have to cut off the calculation.、Yeah. Uh, so it takes much time to,、uh, to do such a calculation. So How long did the examples that you played take to calculate?、Uh, yeah, so for the three gigahertz mas-、uh, in the three gigahertz machine,、uh, it takes uh, uh, for, for 10 seconds. Input, we need 10 seconds.、Uh, so we can calculate by,、uh, by using the 3 gigahertz machine、uh, real, by real time, but it's not sufficient for actual use. Yeah, this is about your final project. Ah, yeah.
Okay, hi. I'm going to be talking about the chord recognition, about this paper that was one of the suggested papers uh, to read for the Mini Project 3. And the title is Chord Recognition Using uh, Measures of Fit, Chord Templates, and Filtering Methods. So I'll start out by discussing these three aspects compared with, the, with their parallels to the uh, Mini Project 3. So in Mini Project 3, our models, chord models, had were statistical models. So we calculated the, mu uh, the mean vector and the covariance matrix for them. And in order to do that, we needed uh, a lot of labeled data. Here we're using chord templates, and uh, which is much simpler. And in this paper, they use three different types of core template that we'll, I'll get into later. But basically, like the first set just uses the fundamentals, and the other ones include uh, additional uh, partials that get collapsed back into that one octave. In Mini 3, we, we use Gaussians, the uh, multivariate Gaussian density, to get the probability of uh, the chromas uh, with respect to each one of those 25 models. Here, the way we compare how close we are, uh, we, we're actually measuring the distance to get a probability. So the distance between the chroma and each of those uh, core templates. And we use different measures, there's a regular distance, which is the Euclidean distance, and then two other, uh, other measures of fit that I'll discuss, that one of them Ryuichi actually used in his talk, the callback Leibler. And finally, um, how to make up for the strength of hidden Markov model, which used the Viterbi algorithm that draws on the information on the transition matrix. Uh, here we use filtering to, to smooth the data and kind of reincorporate part of the, the past and actually here the future data into, into our signal. So that's the time persistence. So these are the parallels um, between the two systems. So the core templates, um, we use 24 templates, 12 of them just like the mini project, 12 major chords and 12 minor chords. The major chords are composed of the, the first, uh, first, fifth, and eighth semitones, which translate C major translating to C, E, and G. And for the minor chords, we just shift the middle middle note half one semitone to get that pattern. This second set of templates, I guess they experimented with many different, but these are the ones that perform better. The second one uses up to the uh, fourth partials. So you see, by adding the partials, we're adding these two notes, and also this uh, third note has increased in, vol in volume. And with the addition of two more partials, you get two more, and the third one also has increased. And okay, the way they calculate the, the harmonics, the, the, the way they add the partials to the fundamentals, they use that formula 0.6 to the uh, i to the minus 1, where i is the number of the harmonic. So the, the, the volume is decreasing as we're in going up in, uh, in frequency. Okay, so that was the first aspect of the, the paper. The second aspect is the measure of fit, measures of fit. 
which is how, how are we going to compare our cores with, with, the, with the templates. The most obvious one is the Euclidean distance, which is actually formally a mathematical distance because it has these three properties. It is it's non-negative and it's bounded and it's zero if x and y are zero. So they can call that positive definite. And it's symmetrical. X and Y, and then as triangle and quadrant. And the authors are using popular measures of fit. So we use the term measure of fit as opposed to distance because these actually only have a lot of positive definite and are not symmetrical. So they're using different uh, measures of fit from different disciplines and to see if they get any good results. And the fact that, that we hear logarithmically is a good, uh, and this formula works well in speech, so they use that. And it was, it's actually 1968, Itakura and Saito came up with this to get the maximum likelihood estimate of the uh, spectral envelope. And it turns out to get that, you have to minimize that that expression that diverges. And the second one is the callback liver, which comes from probability. And the, the formula in the bottom is actually, they use that, is the probability distribution for probability distributions P and Q. It gives a measure of the distance or how far P and Q are from each other, which kind of makes sense. And then the formula they use in the papers, the generalized form, which they add the minus, they add these two terms. So I draw the graphs of these three and this one is, to be symmetrical, this has to be symmetrical in, with respect to this, this plane of x equals y. So it has a nice bow shape. Obviously, it's symmetrical. And this one, you draw that line, you know, you get things near, near zero on this end, and this one, just here. And here, as you see, the skew, they look different. Yes. 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 And actually, the authors give measurements for uh, for both. So they, for example, they take x to be the template once, and then second time around, they just try differently, and they get different results. So it turns out, for example, here you get a good result, but not, not the other way. So then they add something else. Let's see something else here. And actually, I was playing around with it. I came up with some other ideas you know, for uh, measures of fit. But I guess they don't use absolute values because of smoothness. You, you can't really take derivatives and things. So what other thing they're doing, they're optimizing these measures of fit. So what they're doing. Originally, we have like this. So we're going to call them all distances, even though some of them are just measures. So normally, we have the distance between the chroma and the, the core template. So here, they're adding a scaling uh, factor here. And then they're trying to minimize this expression. So what what they come up with is that for each frame and each core template, you're gonna when 
we solve this problem? To minimize this analytically, you set the derivative to zero and you solve for that h. I guess you can also solve it numerically. But, um, so you end up with uh, 24 times the number of chromas in the, in the track. So you're actually optimizing for every chroma. So the downside is kind of like you don't have the same measure for, for everything, but nonetheless you have a better measure because each time it's, uh, it's like a closer fit. So each one of these things is fitting actually two vectors together. But because this is going to change for every chroma, uh, they're actually different. And actually you do lose uh, uh, the symmetry. Well, once we introduce here, this x and y are no longer. So, so the idea is that this new measure of fit works better overall to give us a better score. And then we just pick our chord the way we picked it before, which is uh, the, the closest one that gives the smallest measure here. OK, so when I ran the test, I got quite an improvement. The authors don't give how much of an improvement they get with that optimization. That's kind of embedded with the other results. But you know, I got a small improvement with that, but I got huge improvement with like the low pass filtering. So here, um, the basic low pass filtering, it tends to smooth the output. And it's unlikely for a chord in a track to last just one frame. So the information in the adjacent frames can be useful to, 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 this, to finding out what really was that state. And this kind of is the parallel to the, the Viterbi, which is more powerful. But uh, this is what they, they theoretically, maybe. So um, the second filter they use, it's a filter that's the median filter. And also, I, the low pass filter actually helps with the, when you're transitioning from chord to chord, because when we're in one chord, we're pretty good actually. The recognition is pretty good. The median filter is used uh, a lot in image processing and it removes the, the noise, the unwanted noise. And the basic idea is that you, you run through the signal and here, we're not running through the signal, but we're running through the distance vectors, entry by entry, and we replace each entry by the median of the adjacent, you know, forward and backward, depending on our window length. And here's some code for <laughs> MATLAB code, which I just put it there's just few lines to, you know, simple filtering there. And MATLAB actually has a median function that you can use. Um, okay. Um, did, did the authors talk about the, the goodness of the results and also the robustness of it? And for the robustness, they use the standard deviation. When, so when it's narrow, you have less variance in your data and it's more robust. So. These three tables show different results regarding those three aspects of the paper, which was the core temp the measures of fit, the core templates, and the filtering method. Well, I start with the middle one because that's where I started to talk with. For the core templates, that's a, the good news is that actually our best uh, template just uses the fundamentals, so you get. Point, uh, nine, point 0.696, which is our maximum uh, score, overlap score. And we have the lowest variance. So the fourth harmonic actually matches that, but it has higher deviation. And I guess the performance may be probably just different after that. 
then we have the measures of fit. And the Euclidean actually turns out to be pretty good, which is very close second to the, the callback version 2, as Professor Ellis mentioned there. We have two versions of these two deviances, depending on uh, where we, which one, which is x the template or is y the template. So, for example, in the KO1, we get a very poor minimum. And here, by the maximum and minimum, what they're doing is that they're just combining all the tests with all the parameters, and they give the worst result. So it might not be that meaningful. So for example, if you rule out something like this, maybe you get improvements in some of those things. But the Euclidean actually turns out to be a very close second to this one. And also, in terms of robustness, it's pretty close. So these two turn out to have, the Itakura turn out to have very bad minimums, but then again, if you eliminate some of the parameters, they, they might turn out to be okay, because after all, the maximums are pretty good. Um, and filtering methods? So, yeah. so, in the mean, maximum and mean, um, this is like over the settings of the other parameters. Yeah. So, I mean, the max column is the one to look at. Right? Yes, actually, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. And as you say, if you do something particularly, yeah. you screw it up. But yeah. There is, there is, the, the max is actually taken from the real system. That's true, yeah. The max is the max is actually what to look at. And in, when you look at the max, it's still the Euclidean comes up very close second to it. They're all very close. They're all very close, that's true. They're all very close. Yeah. And it's, Surprising because we hear logarithmically, but you know we the Euclidean is doing as good. Maybe we're adding other parameters. Maybe the measure of fit changing things around. But the overall thing is that well, we go with just fundamentals in Euclidean, and we're pretty good. So <laughs> that's with the filtering. Um, what I found out was that the low pass actually did uh, uh, quite an improvement. Here, the, the argument is that, well, it's not really LTI here. So you can cascade these. I mean, these filters work in different ways. So you can use both of them. And you can cascade them in different orders. And here, when actually they do change the order, the result is and I guess even though they're in, they work in different ways, but applying one all actually helps out the other one as well. So applying one does a pretty good job. And okay, compared to the state of the art, um, actually I think the first paper that dealt with the chord recognition in commercial music was Shea and Professor Ellis. And after that, it became kind of popular to do that on commercial music. And in 2008, this paper was on 2009. So they're comparing the result with the paper on 2008, which was by Bello and Pickens, which they added a few uh, musical knowledge into the Shea and Ellis paper. And so that in 2008, they achieved the best result, which is 70%. And so this method comes up very close to that. Then they argue that in Beale's music, or in general in blues or uh, popular music, there's a lot of use of the seventh, the dominant seventh chord. So they add that actually, and they improve the result a little bit. And you lose a little bit generality if you want to apply that method to other types of music that don't use the, the seventh chord as much. But anyway, so the results show that they're doing pretty good. 
So in conclusion, it's, it's fast because, well, we don't train anything. The code is pretty short and fast, good results. And uh, as far as I'm concerned, it gives me a different angle to look at the HMM code, so to have better understanding of what's going on there. And these are the references they use. Yes, actually, any of those three aspects could be inner combined with the other aspects. So you could use their templates rather than training the data with a labeled corpus and then use Viterbi and see maybe probably get better numbers there. It's more elegant and more it's kind of Viterbi makes sense. But it could turn out that smoothing can achieve great results too. And they use the uniform uh, scale, so they could try like weighted different, many different things there. But yeah, com the combination would definitely, they, I think this paper is trying to be as generic as, let you know, as, as possible. And definitely uh, that would be a great, great addition. Yeah. Were you able to resynthesize some of the tracks with the, what you have? Well, I, I got percentages. <coughs> I got 65.5%. Overlap. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not getting up to there, but I, uh, I don't know exactly what they're using. So I, I'm working on it to see how much I can improve. I mean, I, I can improve it with methods that we use for many projects, like the, the compression of the chroma, which surprisingly nobody talks about, and that seems to. Nobody uses the same chroma, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Which was a great, I mean, improvement in the Mini 3. But, so I did get more with chroma, but. So you weren't able to listen to Mini Well, when I was doing Mini 3, I basically turned off the listening, and I just went by by the numbers. So when I got 75, I was like, wow, that's. But I mean, you get the basic experience that we got with Let It Be in that demo we had, you see, with the chords and you know, the shepherd tones. And, and it seems like there's not, you know, there's not very much difference between these different systems. Yeah. Which raises the question of statistical significance. When you're doing this stuff, it's like what you can, there's always going to be one system that's going to score best. Yeah. But is it actually significant or is it just like, well, it's a random variation? Yes. So then in, in these kinds of uh, situations there, you get into these statistical tests where you can actually say, okay, well, if I did, if I do, a, you know, 100 trials, yeah. uh, and, it's, and two systems are actually the same, but they have a certain amount of variation, then I'm going to expect to see this degree of difference between them. Yes. If you see more than this, then it's statistically meaningful. Yes. So it, it is not significant. Yeah. Definitely, yeah, exactly. It definitely raises the question of whether there's any significant Yeah. 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 Any questions? Any questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. They seem to have interesting stuff going on, but I haven't quite, I don't, you know, I feel like I don't fully understand what yeah, the I, distinctions are. I didn't show here, but I added some more, and I was playing around with the MATLAB. Yeah. And some of them actually look very pretty. You know? <laughs> yeah, that but, were nice figures. Yeah, but actually, with, when you use the absolute value, 
Yeah. I guess if you don't use the optimization and you don't differentiate, yeah. you can still get away with using absolute values. Yeah, yeah, I, I, exactly. I mean, smoothness is, there are cases where you need different, a differentiable yeah. distance function, but there are, yeah. I'm not sure if these, if this is those. I have some moth-looking, butterfly-looking functions. <laughs> Great. I promise. Oh, okay. All right, so we have a little bit of time. Um, what we were talking about on Monday was um, source separation in the music context, and um, in particular, we looked at a few different schemes. Uh, the simplest scheme, which you know is commonly used for um, stereo music recordings, is t subtracting the left and right channels. If you have a, s a signal that's been mixed and um, you know mixed by panning by changing the relative level of the signals in the two in the left and right channels. Um, very often, you put the most important instruments in the center of the, the pan, which is mainly the lead vocal. And that means if you subtract the left from the right, then you cancel out anything that's common to both, and you, you're left only with the differences between the two channels. But even if you pan elsewhere in the space, there's going to be some balance between the two channels that removes them, which is equivalent to the instantaneous mixing situation we had for the... Uh, the spatial filtering, and so with uh, with the uh, by changing the balance between left and right, which is what this middle event middle thing does, you can get you can uh, cancel out individual instruments. If you've got a if you've got a proper pan signal, then you can cancel out one instrument by subtracting left from right in the right balance, and then you can't the other remaining instruments. You sort of used up your one degree of freedom. The remaining instruments will all be present. You can only do that once. But it's, it's, it's still an interesting thing to listen to in terms of the mix. Um, sorry. So, uh, let's see. Let me just turn on the sharing so you can get, you can download this if you haven't downloaded it already. Okay, so um, so on the on the practical site, you can get this code, including this this PD patch. So the first thing in the the patch. Let me just play you that Maxwell thing, Maxwell Silver Hammer. So this, we've got three different methods here, and we can select between the different methods with this uh, selection box here. It's got four, but the fourth one's not connected. The first one just lets you listen to the, each of the channels, basically, or, the, or both channels at once. Just, it just, this just turns off the right channel, turns off the left channel. This one does the, you know, the subtracting with different, different scaling factors. But this one is this thing we were talking about. It's sort of a non-linear filter where basically there was one slide where we had the, where it was let it be, and we saw for each time frequency cell what the, what the inter-oral, inter-channel inter level difference was. And then you're saying we can filter particular values. So this is kind of interesting. Um, oops. What this does is um, has two inputs here, and it performs an FFT on a frameworks FFT. So it's using this blocking thing here. So it's using a 2,000 point window and factor of four overlap. Does the FFT has a panning window here, which it applies to each frame? Does the FFT, and then it takes the real imaginary outputs of the FFT, squares them, and adds them to get a magnitude spectrum, right? So this, within PD, this gives us a little vector of whatever it is, 2048 or 1024 points every frame, which are the 
FFT magnitudes for every bin. So we then add a little offset to make sure it doesn't go to zero, take the absolute value, take, take the magnitude, the square of the sum of the real imaginary parts, add something so it doesn't go to zero, and then we take the ratio of these two sides, and this is now per time frame, per frequency bin, ratio of the, of the uh, energies of left and right channels. Convert that to dB, and then we have a target level difference in, in dB. We subtract it away from that. We have a, a width, which is basically the, how much tolerance we have for, for the uh, target level difference. So we divide by that. And then we square it, add a scaling constant, and then we uh, basically use dB to RMS to calculate a Gaussian. So we calculate the x of minus, minus a half of this distance. And so this Gaussian one, this distance function, right, this sort of Gaussian distance will be um, one if we're right on the target ILD in dB and it'll taper off to zero as we move away. And so we use that basically to scale the level of the, um, of the FFT here and then do the inverse FFT. So we're only allowing through the frequencies whose level difference of that time frame is what we're aiming for. But if you do that just instantaneously frame by frame, it's quite noisy. So here we have a little bit of time smoothing that basically we just um, have this first order pole where we take the value and take its difference from the last value and update by some, some constant alpha times that. So alpha here is the, is the, uh, is the, time, the time smoothing parameter. So if we listen to that, if we listen in the middle, it gives us the voice. And if we turn down the width, so there's quite a lot of noise in this estimation of the in level differences. So you have to smooth it out to get rid of that. But if you do it without any time framing, becomes very kind of choppy. Smooth it out sounds better and then you can you can pick out different instruments by moving around the, the level difference. Okay so that's the uh, the basic parts here and then there are the interesting thing is just to try this on different um, different examples, different music examples because they all have different mixing practices. So why don't you try this out on a couple of things and see um, what kind of separations and instruments you can find. Yeah? When I was trying to uh, work the music in my laptop, it's uh, the layer to be more supported. The what? There is error. You yeah. might be able to track this down from the... What is the error? We resize the MP3. Okay. Let me have a look. Everyone else, let's have a...
All right, um, shall we uh, shall we report back? Who has some stuff that they have found they would like to discuss? Um, so, just with the, uh, I guess the ILD, the filter. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's basically just trying to sort of mimic as if they were handing it. The ILD is sort of the left and right in a way that's how big of like a shifting left and right we're looking at. Um, I'm trying to look exactly what I'm looking at, and I was looking at the exact time to solve it. Did you hear any effect? Could you hear the... I heard something that I couldn't exactly describe what it was. So what... What were you doing at... What were you... What, what, what sound were you listening to? Uh, I was just mad for some And so... You know, let me see if the audio is going to work. Um... So, um, sorry. That's with no alpha, so that's just taking every frame individually. So that's interesting. That definitely sounds smoother, but we're getting a lot more of the background instruments there. So the uh, yeah, it's uh, basically. I mean, it, it, the, uh, a larger alpha stops it from changing. If we look at the actual values of the, um, so this is actually showing us when the actual values of the of the um, gains being applied to different frequency bins in real time. And uh, as we, if we turn alpha down, then you know, well it only updates every second, but you know, it jumps around, you see they're much sharper. And as we turn alpha up, they tend to be um, sort of less dramatic because they're being smooth and they, if we could see them a little faster, we'd see they change less rapidly with time. But if we... Uh, we listen to some of the off, off-center instruments. The effect can be more serious. It's hard to know. It's hard to know what to say. The, 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 this idea of using um, the level difference as a mask, it seems like a powerful idea, and it sort of works, but it doesn't work great. It seems like, well, why is it making mistakes? I've actually mixed these instruments together. These, I mixed this instrument to have this particular ratio of levels, and particularly for this data, it's very exact. It's exactly how it's produced. So why does it ever make mistakes? The the, the problem is, of course, that we're assuming that every time frequency cell only has the contribution of a single instrument in it, right? So, if, and you know, depending on the shape of your time frequency cells, your you may or may not have energy from multiple instruments. And if you have energy from multiple instruments and they have different pan values, then the number you get there is some other value. The ratio of the energies between left and right is going to be some other value. And uh, in, uh, the same, by the same token, if you have other instruments which are overlapping in certain time frequency cells, they, that particular cell's pan value may, by chance, happen to fall within the range that you're selecting. And so that's, that's how you can get stuff not working. And that is um, more common than not, I guess.
Any other experiences or comments that people want to report? Did anyone try the Suzanne Vega track? Yeah, it's completely bizarre that when the Beatles mixed those albums that they would put the drums hard left. I mean, it's just, it's really strange. And uh, in fact, some, you know, some people say of those albums that the stereo releases are actually worse. That, you know, that you don't want to listen to them because it's the, the, the stereo is so distracting. That you're better off listening to the original mono mixes, which are the ones that the actual, the band were involved in, uh, in, in creating. Um, yeah, so definitely with any kind of anything post-1969 or something, you're going to get the drums um, much more centrally mixed. But even, yeah, but it's, you know, but typically the, the mix is also going to be more complex, so you don't get a single, because the Beatles are working with basically four-track recorders, so they didn't have a lot of dimensions of what to pan, whereas, you know, any, any reasonable studio would use 24 or 48 tracks, so you could get a separate track for every individual drum or whatever, you'd still, you still use a basic pan because that's basically all you need. But, um, but you're going to have a lot more specific pan values present in the mix. Yeah? I found the uh, Maxwell is the only sound that will work in this project. I tried thousands of other sounds in my, in my laptop. And what happens? Well, I mean, it doesn't work. I mean, you're going to get any separation between instruments, or? Uh, it, doesn't, uh, it doesn't read it. Anymore. It doesn't read it? Yeah, it feels weird. Like so I, I'm not sure if it, if it yeah. is actually just designed for the next world. Well, no, I, so, I mean, well, it, but it, your, your problem is just with the MP3 reader, right? It's not, I mean, it's like, the, the, it's not so much the separation, it's just that it's not, it's not reading the file, it's not playing the file at all, right? Yeah. The, uh, like I say, the MP3 reader is a little bit ropey in, in PD. You may be able to find a better one if you search, um, you know, or you can convert the files to WAV to read them. But um, it, was, it was nice that there was one available at all. And I'm sorry it didn't, doesn't work so well for you. You might, you might look for an updated version. So, uh, it should be the specific format for the song. It probably does. I mean, uh, P you know, the whole the whole of PD doesn't. The whole of PD just wants to work with 44k signals unless you change it. But you don't. You normally see it only running at 44k. So. Yeah, but uh, uh, all my other music also can be streamed There's quite a lot of different variables in the MP3 format, so. There's something about those files which is upsetting it, but it's strange that they're, it's all your files. It would maybe there's something on your pro, on your computer which is you know added a header to them or something which is messing up the MP3 reader. Yeah. yeah. Just a quick question. Um, you know, you're splitting and then um, uh, I don't Yeah. So, you know, the, the essential thing in calculating is the ratio between the energy in the left and right signals for every frequency bin. So, you know, it's, this is this, this weird thing about how PD handles FFTs, which is it takes an FFT, has a, you know, 500 samples of signal, takes an FFT, and then it replaces it with, other, with 500 samples of signal, but now, instead of time advancing, frequency is advancing, and then it just repeats every frame. So you know, there's this weird thing where you can, it looks like this sort of normal PD thing where you're running through every sample, but instead you're running through every frequency bin every, and, and, then, and then resetting every frame. So when we get, when we calculate this ratio in here, what's coming out here is a rapid sequence of the energy ratios in every frequency bin over the FFT and then looping around. 
So that's just, but that's just the energy in units, so between zero and whatever it is, infinity. But then I convert it to dB to do the work because when I want to do this, um, this Gaussian window to calculate whether what the gain is going to be, I want the, the difference between you know, the center of where I'm going to take the gain and the place where I start rejecting it, I want that to be a fixed ratio, which means a fixed number of, a fixed amount in dB or a fixed amount in a, in a log scale, a constant value in a log scale. So I just want to work in a, in a log scale of that ratio, which is why I, I it's not, they're not really dB. I mean, they are, I'm using dB, but I'm not using them as dB because they're not, I'm not, I'm no longer talking about energies. I'm just talking about a ratio, but I want to, I want to operate on it in a log scale. So I use the, the dB operators just as a convenient way to get a log scale out. Yeah, that's a bit confusing. Yeah. So this this thing that plays the sound file, um, you know, reads it into a buffer here. Um, This resize zero is just to it resizes the buffers to zero so that anything that's in them already gets de deleted because they just and then um, these this these uh, this read function will read a, a WAV file but it'll automatically change the size of the buffers to be whatever it needs to be just you know because we don't know what the size of the sound file is ahead of time. If you look at the help for for read, it should. Oh, sorry. This is the command that we're sending to Soundfiler. The command is read minus resize. So if you look at the 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 help for Soundfiler, it tells you about these parameters. I'm not sure. I guess if it's a stereo file, you send it to the names of two. Two buffers. All right. Uh, I guess we should, we've ever run. So, any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, I'll see you on Monday, and we'll have the final class, which will be a few more.